Well, good morning, RPE people. I'm really excited to be here, super excited to see you all here uh, and to uh, see you all connect with each other, connect with the agency, because uh, if there's anything that the world needs right now, it's energy innovation. Well, maybe it needs love, uh, but energy <laughs> innovation next. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be sitting up here with uh, Bud Peterson, the president of Georgia Tech. I uh, just want to briefly introduce him before we start into the dialogue. Uh, Bud Peterson has served as Georgia Tech's president for nine years, which is a lifetime in academia, as uh, you academics out there will know. Under his leadership, Georgia Tech has developed and begun the implementation of a 25-year strategic plan. So he is thinking long-term. Uh, he has exceeded the $1.5 billion goal for the Georgia Tech campaign by 20%. So by my math, that's $1.8 billion in fundraising. Uh, he's grown innovative collaborations and strategic partnerships, which we will talk about here. Uh, expanded the campus infrastructure and increased national and global visibility for Georgia Tech. Uh, notably in that time, applications have more than tripled and enrollment has increased by 45%. The Institute has been a frequent recipient of RPE funding for research, which he's going to tell us about, and has two RPE fellows. So welcome. It's really exciting to be here with you. Great. Great to be here, David. Thanks for having me. So Appreciate tell me what gets you excited, or maybe even better, what gets your students excited and your faculty excited when they think about energy innovation? What's on their minds? Uh, I think that, that one of the things that gets them really excited is the opportunities that exist, uh, opportunities to have a significant impact. One of the biggest changes I've seen, I think, in students in the past 20, 25 years, 30 years, has been a focus on innovation. Uh, Students used to come to places like Georgia Tech. They wanted to go to work for Delta or Boeing or IBM or large companies. And now we see a lot of students that are coming uh, to places like Georgia Tech that want to start their own company. They want to create their own job. And that's a big shift, I think. Yeah, so tell me, has there been a change in the culture? So some people think of academia as kind of a, a dusty place uh, filled with chalk dust. And how has that changed? Well, we're not using chalk much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, again, I think the student expectation of the type of interaction that they'll have with our faculty, with industry, uh, has uh, developed, uh, and it's a much more robust, much more inclusive type of uh, relationship. We have about 40% of our students that uh, either co-op or do an internship while they're at Georgia Tech, and so they're interacting with industry people in all a whole broad range of industries during their time as undergraduate students. And so how does the university nurture that entrepreneurial culture? You were telling me a little bit backstage about some of the uh, competitions and opportunities for them. Uh, we've got a whole host of, pro of uh, different types of programs uh, at Georgia Tech. I kind of think of it as we get students as freshmen and they leave as, as seniors or as graduates. And during their time at Georgia Tech, they can experience and explore a lot of different uh, types of activities uh, that are related to uh, new innovation, uh, new startups, new businesses. We start, last year we started about 100 companies out of the technologies at Georgia Tech, and, and we think that within uh, maybe five or eight years, we'll be starting somewhere in the order of 300, uh, 300 uh, new companies each year. A lot of times people think of these startup companies as being the result of the research that's going on, uh, and that's been another big shift. Most of the companies that we're starting up at Georgia Tech today are companies that are starting from undergraduates. I, they have ideas, uh, they bring those ideas forward. Um, one of the early programs we had was a program called the Inventure Prize, and it's a, it was really Shark Tank before Shark Tank existed, so mm. this will be our 10th competition of this Inventure Prize. We had about 300 student teams that competed with their ideas. They have to have a, a real product, they can't just have an idea, so they have a real product and uh, they go through a competition uh, with a business plan and their ideas and present their ideas, and then we have the the uh, either six or eight finalists, uh, and we'll do a live television broadcast on Georgia Public Broadcasting that uh, the students prepare a four or five minute video uh, before they come to the competition, and then they come, they present the video, they're on stage before a live audience, about 1,000 or 1,100 people. Um, they show the video, they make a three or four minute presentation, and then there's a panel of judges, either people that have started businesses or venture capitalists that ask them questions. So it's very much like Shark Tank, except the, the, uh, the people asking questions don't invest uh, in the companies. The first prize is $20,000, second prize is $15,000, uh, and um, our Office of Intellectual Property helps the students uh, protect their IP. 
Uh, there's a people's choice, so people watch it on television can vote, and that's $5,000. Hmm. Uh, and what's interesting, we're starting the 10th competition, so we've had eight, we finished the ninth one, so we've had eight competitions where there has been a winner the previous year, and of those eight competitions, four of them, by the next year's competition, uh, had uh, commercialized their product. So what kind of companies have come out of that? Uh, so one that actually is focused on the energy industry uh, is, uh, it's called Tech, TEQ Charging. And so if you think of uh, uh, charging for electric vehicles, and just think of this as kind of a power strip for uh, charging electric vehicles. So uh, you pull into a parking lot or a parking garage and there's usually one charging station and one parking spot. What this technology does is it allows you to take that one charging station and maybe spread it over five or ten parking spots. So you can pull in and, and I mean, the problem with one charging station is a car pulls in, hooks up, and then it's there all day uh, while somebody's at work. So you can have ten, ten parking spaces that are serviced by a single charging station. You can pull in at eight o'clock and you're going to stay till five o'clock. So you can sign on and say, I want a full charge over this eight hour period. I can come in and say, I want a full charge in 30 minutes. Uh, and so I get priority and I pay a higher rate. Mm. Uh, and so it's kind of like a power strip for charging. And this was an idea that came out through this Inventure Prize. It's now being uh, tested in markets in Georgia and Florida. Oh, that's really cool. And you can see it kind of gels with the theme of customized energy and personalized and distributed energy, which I think is a big theme in, in, the, in the system right now. So you've got some faculty entrepreneurs too? Uh, yeah, and uh, actually ARPA-E has been very supportive. We've had 11 ARPA-E projects. Uh, one of our first projects was Deepak Devon, a faculty member who um, really uh, developed a, uh, uh, a, a way to improve the efficiency of distribution systems. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it. He had an ARPA-E contract. He developed uh, an idea through that fundamental research and then wanted to start a business. And so we allowed him to go on leave. He went uh, on leave for several years and started a company and now has come back uh, to Georgia Tech. The company's doing well. Uh, and so a lot of success with ARPA-E. Well, I think we have three active projects right now. And how do you see ARPA-E's role in kind of the broader energy innovation ecosystem? Well, it's been great for us. Uh, it's been great in terms of providing opportunities for our faculty and our students to engage in some, some high-risk behavior. Norm Augustine just talked about high-risk behaviors in the I-beam. I heard him when we were in the back there. Mm. Um, and it allows faculty to take some risks in these high-risk uh, high types of uh, technologies. I think that's what the goal of ARPA-E is to is to try to focus on some high-risk technologies, develop those technologies, and bring them into the marketplace. And so we've had, again, a number of faculty, I think three active projects now in some very interesting areas. Yeah. You mentioned intellectual property before. Uh, I think this might be of interest to some in the audience who are thinking about the university either as a source of intellectual property or as a holder of intellectual property. How does, how does Georgia Tech and how do you think about intellectual property? So I think we... Um, I won't say unique, but we have a very liberal policy with respect to intellectual property. I was at a, another institution for a number of years, and, and it seemed like we spent an awful lot of time trying to uh, uh, get attorneys in the room and a whole bunch of people in the room, and, and I'll say argue, maybe not argue, but debate and discuss what would happen with the uh, intellectual property that might result from a particular research project. Uh, I think we take a much more liberal approach. What we are trying to do as a state institution, we're trying to build the economy of the state of Georgia, build the economy of the country. And so our biggest goal is not necessarily to try to make money off of intellectual property as a, as a university, but to try to make sure that the intellectual property is successful. Uh, a great example, um, we had a, an undergraduate student a number of years ago in the uh, late 90s who had an idea for security system for computers. He started a, had an idea as an undergraduate. Georgia Tech worked very hard with this undergraduate student, put him in touch with this really experienced older person who was 24 years old, uh, had a business degree. Uh, they started this company, uh, at ISS, and sold it to IBM for 1.6 billion. Uh, we now have, it's Chris Klaus was the, the student, the undergraduate student, and we now have the Chris Klaus Advanced Computing Building. Hmm. Um, we didn't, if we had uh, spent a lot of time working uh, or uh, 
having him try to figure out how are we going to protect the intellectual property, who's going to get it, who's going to own it. He couldn't afford an attorney um, and probably would have failed. But because Georgia Tech took an approach of trying to help him be successful, uh, the company succeeded and we received some significant benefits. His partner, Tom Noonan, we have the uh, Noonan Golf Facility. So these are people that were very successful and remember Georgia's, Georgia Tech's uh, efforts to try to help promote uh, their technologies. An experienced 24-year-old, huh? Uh, yeah. yeah I haven't, I haven't well, it was interesting. He came back to write a, uh, give us a check at the, at the, uh, uh, the dedication or uh, when he was going to give us a check, and he landed in the Atlanta airport, and uh, he was not old enough to rent a car. Uh, <laughs> but he developed this very successful business, and he's been instrumental in helping us expand what we're doing in the whole in innovation and entrepreneurship space uh, in terms of new business startups. Sounds like, though, you think that intellectual property sometimes gets in the way of innovation. Well, I'm not sure the intellectual property gets in the way. I think the uh, discussions about who's going to own it and, and who's going to control it is kind of what gets in the way. I think a lot of times people that have ideas, they just want to get on with the idea. They mm -hmm. want to move forward and try to figure out how they, can, uh, how they can take their idea and move it into the marketplace. So how can small businesses then connect with Georgia Tech or with universities more generally? Like if I have a, a great idea and I'm looking for technical resources or startup resources, how would somebody go about that? So Georgia Tech as a state institution um, has an organization called the Enterprise Innovation Institute. It's funded by the state of Georgia. We get about eight and a half million dollars a year. And if you think of, uh, think of it a little bit like a land-grant institution has ag extension service. So mm -hmm. land-grant institutions have these agricultural extension services. They have a county agent in every, every county in the state to try to help farmers and ranchers. This is like a technology extension service. Uh, so the Enterprise Innovation Institute and some various other aspects of it, we have about 27 locations around the state where if you're in Georgia and you have an idea for a, a new business and you need some help, or you have an existing business and you want to work on lean, uh, lean manufacturing or Six Sigma uh, processes, or you just want access to some uh, technological expertise, we've got people around the state that have offices and you can go in there and they can help connect you with the talents and the technologies that exist uh, at Georgia Tech. It's interesting that the state feels like this is an important part of their economic development strategy. Yeah. It, um, I mean, Georgia, Georgia Tech was actually established in 1885 to try to help move, af after the Civil War, to try to help move the state of Georgia from an agricultural economy or uh, an agrarian economy to an in industrial-based economy. And I think what we're doing now is, is trying to focus a little bit more on an information-based mm. economy. So mm. um, the state has, has funded that, uh, started, I think, in uh, 1985, been hugely successful. Now, you've got a lot of relationships with big companies, and I'm especially interested in this relationship between information and energy. So that's a big theme that's going on right. in the energy uh, innovation space. Uh, how, how is that going at Georgia Tech? So one of the things that we did uh, when I came to Georgia Tech or went to Georgia Tech uh, nine years ago, we did a strategic plan, and people were talking about creating Silicon Valley of the East. Um, I didn't think that was going to happen. I still don't think it's going to happen. Silicon Valley was kind of the planets were all aligned, several big companies, HP, other companies out there, Stanford, and things just kind of aligned and, and created this very unique culture. But what we did in the strategic planning process was to try to think about what are the advantages that we have in Atlanta that are unique and that we can leverage to try to help build the economy. Uh, and one of the real advantages is the number of Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, Fortune 100 companies. I think there's 17 uh, or 18 Fortune 500 companies that have their headquarters in Atlanta. So one of the things we tried to do was to figure out how we could connect these large companies with the talent technology that exists at Georgia Tech. And I'll say immediately adjacent to campus. Actually, it's part of it's on our campus, but it's right next to the campus. So our, uh, College of Business, the Hotel and Conference Center, uh, the bookstore, a uh, number of research labs are located. And around those, in that particular area, which we call Technology Square, we've seen uh, large companies come in and create an outpost. The first one, about six years ago, Panasonic came in. They located about 20 people. Uh, typically, these innovation centers have between 20 and 40 people uh, from the uh, corporate headquarters, if you will, kind of an outpost, and they're there to try to interact uh, with our faculty, with our students, uh, with our researchers, to, 
to try to access again the talent and technology. So today we have, uh, I think, 22 of these corporate innovation centers, companies like Coca-Cola, Delta, Boeing, uh, AT&T Mobility, Panasonic, uh, Keysight Technologies, Anthem, and then some other companies that maybe surprise people, Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. uh, and the Home Depot. Uh, both have innovation centers. Uh, they will hire our students. Home Depot hires about 20 interns a year. Um, and uh, in their innovation center, uh, I'm sorry, 20 interns a semester in their innovation center. And again, they're trying to figure out how to access some of the technologies that are being developed. And how about uh, in the energy area in particular? Uh, energy area, Southern Company has an innovation center and they're uh, interacting with our students on uh, trying to uh, uh, identify more efficient ways to generate, distribute, and use uh, power. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was, uh, it's interesting with Southern Company, each of these innovation centers has gotten better and better, a little more glitzy. Each mm -hmm. one gets a little better and better. So when you look at some of the first ones, this were started five or six years ago, um, you walk into Southern Company and it's this super high tech, uh, very busy place with lots of students, lots of faculty interacting with people from Southern Company looking at a whole host of projects that have to do with distribution efficiency, uh, with technologies uh, to improve uh, generation efficiency, um, and uh, so very exciting. Are the startups that are coming out of Georgia Tech connecting with these uh, big companies? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what's happening. So if you have an idea for a new company, there are lots of ways to start it. The one people most commonly think of is that you find a VC, a venture capitalist, that will invest uh, in your company and give you some capital for some equity. Uh, what we're seeing with these large companies and these innovation centers is the large companies are making investments. They're either making investments in, this, in the startup, kind of this startup ecosystem, uh, these hundred or so companies that we have, uh, or else purchasing uh, the companies. Mm -hmm. AT&T Mobility uh, had, uh, uh, when they came in and we were showing them around some of these innovation centers in Tech Square, we showed them five companies. Uh, that we thought they might be interested in five startup companies and they have a relationship with three of those companies today. Hmm. They actually bought one of them and licensed the technology on a couple of others. Hmm. So you use the term ecosystem, which I think is a very evocative term. It suggests that there are different roles that different kinds of entities play and that through their interactions, sort of the whole is the su greater than the sum of its parts. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that idea and maybe about Atlanta as a place. So I think a lot of people might think, oh, to do innovation, I have to go to California or I have to go to Boston. And I think there are places all over the country where people can do innovation, including energy innovation. And I think Atlanta has captured a little bit of that magic. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's, uh, there's a whole host of different types of activities that are that are focused on this innovation. Of course, Georgia Tech, we have, uh, I don't know how many programs, uh, you know, maybe 15, maybe more programs that allow our students, our faculty and staff to innovate. We've got a summer program called CreateX. And I mentioned Chris Klaus and ISS. He actually provided a gift uh, that let us start this CreateX program. So we, it's a summer, it's a class, a course that students take in the summer. They compete to get in the class. Uh, the first cohort we did had, I think we had 14 companies. Uh, this past year we had about 40 student companies. It's about a 12-week program. They learn about how to start their company and how to take this idea that they have for a company and move it forward. If they complete the 12-week 12 sec uh, session, they can get uh, $20,000 of venture capital. Uh, and so we had, uh, of the 40 companies, we had a pretty large number that accepted this uh, this venture capital and are, and are trying to create and start the company. So we've got those types of programs. We've got the Inventure Prize that I mentioned. Uh, we're an I, one of the first three i nodes. So the National Science Foundation, I'm on the National Science Board, the National Science Foundation a number of years ago when Subra Suresh was the director, realized that uh, what they wanted to do is to try to figure out how they could take uh, some of the technologies and research that was being done uh, National Science Foundation uh, provides about $7 billion of research funding a year to universities, and they wanted to figure out how to get some of that research into the marketplace and commercialize it. So they started this program called i where a faculty member that has a NSF grant can write a very simple proposal and get $50,000 to help start a company. But NSF realized that most of our faculty um, most of our faculty understand that an idea is not an invention and an mm. invention is not a product, mm. but they don't understand that a product is not a business, and so they need some help. Uh, and so 
NSF established three nodes, one at Michigan, one at Georgia Tech, and one at Stanford to help faculty move these ideas that they developed in their research labs with NSF funding into the marketplace. So a whole host of different, ide uh, different uh, activities that are going on, not all of them are uh, uh, related to Georgia Tech. There's a, a tech, uh, tech Square Labs, which is an entrepreneur who started a company, actually one of our alums, and he now has an incubator right there in Tech Square where he works with companies that he wants to invest in. Uh, David Cummings, uh, no relation to, no relationship or association or affiliation with Georgia Tech, started uh, Atlanta Tech Village. He has a uh, building, I don't know how many square feet, but he rents a desk. So if you've got an idea for a startup company, you can go and rent a desk from him. And if you, as your company grows, you can rent two desks or four desks. And if you rent four or five desks, then you get a room. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it allows these ideas to kind of grow. And you get all these entrepreneurs that are working together that kind of self-educate uh, and help self-replicate these new ideas for new businesses and new companies. So it's very exciting, very energetic uh, type of environment. Um, uh, probably a big breakthrough for me was uh, maybe f four or five years ago, uh, Ralph De La Vega was the president and CEO of AT&T Mobility, and I was talking to him about starting an innovation center. And he brought four or five people down, they spent three or four hours, and he said, so Bud, you've convinced us we want to start a, they call it a foundry because a foundry is where you make things, but it's really their innovation center. We, where's some space? And I said, well, the, uh, there's an archdiocese that's trying to sell some property, property six or eight blocks from here, and the good thing is it's right next to the AT&T headquarters building, uh, big 40, 45-story building. And he said, well, two problems, four, five or six blocks is too far away, and the second problem, the last place I want to start an innovation center is in the shadow of the corporate headquarters. Mm. And I said, oh, I kind of get it. He says, these guys are going to be coming in, these young men and women are going to be coming in in flip-flops and shorts at 11 o'clock in the morning, and I don't necessarily want the suits to see that. Uh, and so um, it's a very creative, energetic, uh, uh, busy place. So I, th I think one of the things that you've described is the university exercising leadership to create this regional environment. And another area I think uh, I understand that Georgia Tech is leading is with the campus use of energy. Uh, you've got some innovative buildings, some innovative programs to try to show the way towards the uh, energy transition. Could you talk a little bit about what you're doing in terms of your own facilities? Sure. We've got a great relationship with Georgia Power and Southern Company. We're looking at smart grid uh, on the campus so that we have our own electrical grid. Um, we've got just recently got a $30 million gift from the Candida Foundation to build a living building. So I, everybody's familiar with LEED certification. This uh, living building challenge is like LEED certification on steroids. Hmm. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they gave us a gift of $30 million to build about a 45,000 square foot facility building that uh, will have a zero carbon and zero water footprint. It, it'll be the first building of its kind in the southeast. There's, I know there's one in Pittsburgh. We went to visit at the Phipps uh, Conservatory uh, up there and one in Seattle, uh, but it's the first one in the southeast. So this is a really exciting project. It, we're trying to use the campus as kind of a living laboratory for energy conservation mm -hmm. and energy usage. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, in 2009, 2010 timeframe uh, when everybody was talking, the federal government was talking about shovel-ready projects, uh, and that was, you know, in stimulus funding, uh, we got a pretty sizable grant to uh, build uh, the Carbon Neutral Energy Solutions Building, CNES. Uh, it houses our strategic energy initiative, which is really, again, focused, uh, campus-wide effort to focus on uh, efficient uh, generation distribution and use of, of energy. So. A lot going on on the campus. Probably the most exciting thing to me is the fact that we're trying to use the campus to try and test different types of technologies. Uh, water conservation. Uh, uh, we, each of the buildings that we've built in the past several years, past five, six, seven years, eight years, I guess, uh, we have a cistern. We collect water, use it gray water to, uh, for the toilets and watering the grounds and the grass. Uh, and so a lot of uh, energy conservation activities that we're testing on the campus mm -hmm. as part of our whole uh, campus infrastructure. 
Yeah, I'm really looking forward to being there with your conference in, in April. Uh, I'll be part of the Strategic Energy, Ini Energy Initiative conference. Well, let's, let's circle back to the students. So I think, to, to me, what's most exciting is to see this next generation get it really uh, fired up about energy. I mean, energy, I think, had been seen as kind of a boring area, but now it seems like it's sort of exploding with the infusion of, of information technology, with new materials. Um, can you feel that on campus? Yeah, I think that that uh, it's an area that's kind of opened up in the past uh, maybe 10 years. We've seen a, a broadening of the interest level in it. For a while, it was there was all this focus on you know wind energy and solar energy and and how can we you know build renewable energy. But that's we've seen uh, that uh, whole energy space expand into, as you mentioned, new materials and how can you utilize these new materials to improve uh, transmission efficiency, uh, improve the, the operation of uh, various devices uh, that produce energy and utilize energy. Um, uh, the uh, data analytics in terms of energy usage and how we can use data analytics to optimize distribution systems. Uh, we've got a new company, a startup company at, in Atlanta, Georgia Tech, that, uh, that's focused on that. So a very exciting space that we're seeing continued growth and opportunities, and, and certainly the support that ARPA, RPE provides is instrumental in that. Yeah, so um, we've just got a few minutes left. Maybe let's circle back to the question of RPE, the role of federal funding, and how you see the national environment for supporting science and technology. Well, uh, federal, uh, those of you that are associated with universities understand how important federal funding is. We do uh, about $850 million worth of funded research at Georgia Tech each year. Uh, a good portion of that, 60%, 70% of it is, is uh, federal funding. Uh, and that provides the feedstock for some very basic research that can lead to a lot of these startup companies and, and new technologies. Uh, RPE has been great for us. Again, we've had 11 total projects. It's a very lean organization, approaches research a little different than, than the rest of DOE. Uh, in a very positive way. I think they have 40 employees and oversee 300, 300 million dollars of research doing some really forward-looking types of activities in, in terms of the projects they fund. And so it's been hugely important to us in terms of what we're doing in the energy space. And how do you see the United States, is it, is it still an, a leader in innovation? In your oh, vision? Yes, absolutely. And a lot, of, a lot of that innovation emanates from the federal research uh, support, the support that universities have for, uh, for, for basic research where you don't have a particular uh, a concept of where the research might take you, but that forms the basis and groundwork for so many of the discoveries. Uh, for the iPhone, I mean, you can go and NSF did a an, uh, video on the iPhone and how the fundamental research that was funded by the federal government through the National Science Foundation and some of it through uh, DARPA has uh, made the iPhone possible, and you think, you know, this is only 10 years old. How did we, I, I left mine backstage, I'm getting nervous without it here. Uh, but how, <laughs> you know, how, did we func how did we function before we had those? And it was the fundamental basic research that was uh, supported by the federal government that really make, helped make that possible. Yeah, and innovation is a, it's a global system these days, and there's both elements of cooperation and competition. I'm sure Georgia Tech sees students coming from all over the world to learn from the United States and also to take some of those those ideas home. And I think it's important to think about that sort of regional connection, the national connection, the global connection. All these are important to build a system that is really gonna transform our energy energy use globally. It's an exciting time, an exciting time to be at a university and an exciting time to be at Georgia Tech, having a great time. Great, well thank you very much for joining us here today. It's been a pleasure and I wish you all good luck as you move through this summit. Thanks, Thanks. again. Thanks, David.